chapter 5 today, just two verses, verses 1 and 2. And I'll have you turn there if you're not there already. And if you're able, I'll ask you to stand and you can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right, where you're seated. Beginning in verse 1, <clears throat> pardon me, where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus and by the Holy Spirit says, verse 1, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and verse 2, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Would you pray with me and we'll ask God's blessing on our understanding? Loving Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for your word and this time that we have together in your word this morning. But Lord, we're keenly aware that unless you, as only you can, by the Holy Spirit, give us eyes of understanding, the time that we do have together in your word is going to be a waste of time, and I believe none of us here today in this beautiful church want for that to happen. Lord, we're also keenly aware that the enemy has the propensity to distract us and get our minds to wander so that we miss what it is that you would desire to minister to us in and through your word. So we're going to ask you to give us that ability to focus and give you our undivided attention so that we can hear and perhaps more importantly, heed your word. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So, this is one of those teachings that I, and I don't do this very often, but I change the title like seven times. I mean, I, I try to, title the expositional teaching of God's Word pertaining to where we're at in God's Word. And this is one of those places in God's Word where the first title I chose, I'm looking at it and I'm just, no, nah, that's not really quite it. And then the second title was really not <laughs> it. And then about the sixth, seventh time, the Lord just kind of hit me upside the head as oftentimes He needs to. And gave me this title of the source of love. And the reason I chose that title is because God is love and as such the source of love. It's not that God has love. No, God is love. And that's the source from which we too can love. Here in chapter 5, the Apostle Paul is continuing his exhortation from the previous chapter. And in so doing, he's actually sort of setting the stage for what he's going to address in the rest of the epistle. And for those of you who read ahead and stay ahead, you know what's in store for us in the rest of this epistle really good nuts and bolts, practical information and application as it relates to the Christian life, the Christian marriage, the Christian career, the Christian workplace, and all of the above. But more specifically, he needs to sort of lay this foundation of the paramount importance of love. It all comes down to love, without which we, as God's people, will have no hope of living a godly and holy life. And please don't get tripped up on this 
word holy. We're to be holy as he is holy. And that can be kind of intimidating on its face. I like to see holiness and say of holiness that it's wholeness, not half, not three quarters, but whole and full. A holy life is a fulfilled life, a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. I know this might seem like a firm grasp of the obvious, but Holy Spirit, holy life, I know, deeply profound, isn't it? <laughs> That's how we live a holy life. We live a holy life by way of the Holy Spirit that fills us to wholeness, to fullness, to where our lives become rivers of living water, torrents, powerful torrents of living water. And it all comes down to love. In order to better understand what it is that Paul is saying when he says that we're to walk in the way of love, we need to bring in the last verse in the previous chapter for the sake of context. And the reason is, is that we're provided with the how of the Spirit of God, which empowers us to do the what of the Word of God. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, and here it is, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Notice that God enables us to forgive others vis-a-vis -vis the forgiveness that God has first given to us. That's the source. Let me say it this way. The source of forgiveness is having been forgiven. God is the source of our forgiveness, which fuels, if you will, us in our forgiving of others. How can I forgive you? Because God has first forgiven me. Enter the text that's before us today. The Apostle Paul is connecting the dots between forgiving one another and loving one another. And the common denominator is this source such that forgiveness and love for each other comes by way of God's forgiveness and love for each and every one of us. Just as we're able to forgive each other because God forgave us, so too will we be able to love each other as God loves us. I know I've shared this many times in the past, but early in our marriage, I thought I was being so profound and spiritual and godly, and I just had this moment of inspiration, and I wanted to share this inspiration with my wife, just to express to her my love for her, and so I said to her, honey, God has given me a love for you that can only come from him. To which she, as only a wife can, responded. Really? <laughs> you mean I'm so unlovable? That the only way you can love me is if God gives you a love for me? I'm like, what? Where did you get that? How did you do that? Listen, wives, we love you, okay? But 
how do you do that? How can you take something that is so from the heart, so sincere, so genuine, and, and take it and just, I mean, twist it into this pretzel that looks nothing like that which we had originally intended it to be? And so I had to try to explain to her, no, that's, that's not it at all. I am told that I have to love you as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And there's no way that I can love you that way unless God is the source of the love so I can love you that way. Whenever I do a wedding, which I love doing weddings, I always talk to the husband about loving his wife, which is exactly what Paul's going to talk about next. Loving his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And then sometimes I will even query the groom right there in the middle of the wedding ceremony and I'll say, how are you going to do that? And really puts them on the spot. You could hear the collective gasp from amongst all of those in attendance. And I answer the question for him, which takes the pressure off of him. And I say to him, you can't. There's no way. It's impossible for you to love her that way. The only way you can love her that way is with the love that God gives you for her. That's the only way. And that's what Paul is saying here. Now, notice in verse 1 where Paul says, follow God's example. I like how another translation renders it because it really captures what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He says, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. Now, why do I point this out? Because children will imitate their parents naturally, just as children of God will imitate their heavenly father supernaturally. I remember when my oldest son was like six, seven years old, and we're sitting down for dinner, and we're getting into a discussion slash argument and he is arguing with me contending with me and my wife looks at me and says to me how does it feel to argue with yourself <laughs> and that's you that's he's 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 imitating you My daughter, Sabia, very dramatic and expressive. And, and she, she's, not, <laughs> she's not bashful or shy. And I'll even ask her, you know, before you get up to sing, I mean, you know, here last year she sings before 80,000 people at the U.S. Tennis Open in New York. And I asked her, I said, are, are you nervous? She says, no. <laughs> nervous for you. I mean, she just has this, this um, way about her, and when she talks, she's, she's, you know, puts her hand, and, and she'll put her hands and point, and, and one day my, my wife just kind of taps me on the shoulder and goes, where do you think she got that from? <laughs> you know how it is, husbands, right? We want to say, hey, she gets that from you, honey. <laughs> no, she gets it from you. <laughs> she's kind of imitating your mannerisms and your behavior and even just the way you talk. We were at a, a graduation uh, award ceremony uh, Wednesday night at Kalaheo High School. My 17-year-old uh, son, Levi, is going to graduate uh, this Wednesday. <laughs> So I'm waxing all, you know, sentimental and sappy and because it was in the gym. 
And I made this comment to him. I said, you know, Levi, it just seems like yesterday I was here registering you for high school. He's going, stop it. What are you going to do, cry? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I just went so fast. And now we're in that gym and he's going to get an award and so proud of him. And so after the ceremony, this teacher comes up to me and says, are you Levi's dad? I'm always a little <laughs> careful initially to respond quickly because it depends. <laughs> Why do you want to know? <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> no, uh, are you Levi? Yes. Uh, I just want to tell you, turns out she's a sister in Christ. She says, I want to just tell you that you really raised him right. He has a joy about him. He loves the Lord. He's grounded. <laughs> I'm, I'm bawling, you know. <laughs> oh, 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 I really needed to hear that. And she's just going on and on and on about my son. And as she's talking, I never talked to her before, never met her before. And then she just looks at me and she says, he got that from you. <laughs> I'm on the floor, you know, <laughs> weeping and bawling. And... We imitate those with whom we spend the most time with and are around the most, right? Do you see where I'm going with this? Does this not presuppose that we're spending time with and are close enough to the Lord to begin with in order to become like Him? That's how it works. There's this fascinating account in Acts chapter 4 verse 13 where Peter and John were on trial for preaching Jesus and His resurrection from the dead. We're told that Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly proclaimed that salvation is found in no one, for there is no other name except the name of Jesus by which we must be saved. Then in verse 13, we're told that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary man, <laughs> they were astonished. And here's why. Because they took note that these men had been with Jesus. In other words, they've been around Jesus so much that that's why they're able to do this and proclaim this. That's why they have such boldness. That's why they have such courage. They have been with Jesus. Oh, would to God that it would be said of us, he's been with Jesus. Look at how he's acting. Look at how he's talking. Look at how he's behaving. Obviously, he's been with the Lord. Charles Spurgeon said this, if we are imitators of God as dear children, men will be compelled to recollect that there is a God for they will see his character reflected in ours. I have heard of an atheist who said he could get over every argument except the example of his godly mother. He could never answer that. There is no answer for that. Now the question becomes one of what is it about certain people like this godly mother Spurgeon refers to that would cause the world to say they've been with Jesus. In a word, love. Love. 
it all comes down to and is predicated upon love. Love is the test by which we'll be known as believers in and followers of, disciples of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. He says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. There's the source again. As I have loved you, that's the source for you in turn to love one another. So you must love one another. By this, listen, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And he says it again. If you love one another, that's how they're going to know. Like that song of old, they will know us by our love, by our love. And by the way, that works the other way too. And I'll explain what I mean. It goes both ways. You don't think that Satan knows that it's by our love one for another that we'll be identified as disciples of Jesus Christ? If that's the test, if that's the gauge by which they're going to know, the world's going to know by our love one for another that we're with Jesus, then wouldn't it stand to reason that if it's our love for one another that we're known as disciples of Jesus, that it would conversely be our backbiting and fighting and devouring of one another, that they would question it? Absolutely. I think about what Paul wrote to the churches in Galatia. He says to them, you know what you're doing? You're backbiting, you're gossiping, you're slandering, you're fighting. You're devouring each other. You're going to destroy each other. You keep doing that, you're going to destroy each other. And, and the world is watching, by the way. The world watches us. And they read us like a letter. We are living epistles. How does your epistle le read? How does your letter read? If someone is reading the letter of your life, what are they reading? How does the letter of yours and my life read? One of the things that I found myself asking the Lord for in recent years is to make me more loving towards other people. And it's interesting, that's a, that's a prayer you want to think twice before you pray because you may not like the way that God's going to answer that prayer. You really want me to make you more loving towards other people? Have more compassion? Be kind towards others? Okay. And then God breaks you. And he humbles you. And he brings you to that place where you drink ever so deeply from the cup of his love. And it changes you forever. When you're on the receiving end of God's love for you, at times like that, you can't help but have more compassion and kindness and love and patience for other people. One of the things that, that trials and difficulties do in our lives is they, they make us more compassionate and kind and humble and loving. I think it was Oswald Chambers that said, you have no idea what that person is going through and if you could but walk in their shoes, you would be kinder to them. 
if you could just even for one day walk where they walk, you would be kinder to that person. Maybe that's a word for somebody here today. Maybe for a husband towards the wife or the wife towards the husband. Again, this is where Paul is heading. This is where we're going to be in the weeks that follow. So you have to come back. You can't be not here that day when we talk about this. The Apostle John in his first epistle, chapter 4, I'll read verses 7 through 10, really hits the proverbial nail on the head. Listen to what he says. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Did you catch that? Throughout that is the source for that. Because God first loved us. And it was demonstrated, manifested, in that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Later on in the same chapter, verses 19 through 21, he continues. Listen to this. He says, we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, <laughs> he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Interesting. And this commandment we have from him that he who loves God must love his brother also. You'll forgive me for putting this into a formula, but I think it's apropos that I do. If for no other reason, it's a better way to understand it. But see it this way. Forgiven of much equals loves much, which totals obeying much. Let me say the same thing in a different way. The one who has been forgiven of much loves much, and the one who loves much will obey much. That's how it works. This is the how the law is fulfilled in the sense that we love God with all of our minds, all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our strength vertically, which is the source of loving our neighbor as ourself horizontally. Stay with me on this. Is that not how the law is fulfilled? And does not the law keyword hang on that. Watch this. This is interesting, right? Uh, interesting uh, even typology. So you have the first five commandments that are vertical. Loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, strength. Vertical. Now let's put the horizontal on there. The second five. Loving your neighbor as yourself. It's in the shape of a cross. And until and unless you have the vertical, you can't hang the horizontal. Do you see the source? The source of loving one another 
as I already am head over heels in love with myself, you'll forgive me for saying it that way, I only do so because <laughs> perhaps you've heard it said, well, I can't really love people because I really don't love myself. Give me a break. You love you so much. And that's what Jesus was saying. <laughs> love your neighbor as you already love yourself because you love yourself. Now, how are you going to love your neighbor as much as you already love yourself? Well, you need the source. You need the vertical. It's loving God because he first loved us. Notice he comes down vertically and then horizontally I have the source from which to love one another horizontally. Without this, you don't have this. Because what's that going to rest on? What's that going to rely on? What's that going to come from? John 14, verse 23, Jesus says this. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. <laughs> In other words, if I really love him, I'll want to obey him. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. That's the source again. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. Why would they? Right? These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Now, if you'll bear with me, I want to try to tie it all together because I don't think it's possible to overstate the importance of I've been forgiven of much because of what Jesus did on the cross for me because of his love for me and because I have been forgiven of much I can in turn forgive others of much and because I have been loved so much and forgiven of so much, I too can love so much in return. And because of that love, I will walk in obedience to the Lord. And an obedient life is a holy life, and a holy life is, dare I say, a happy life. I want to close with what I would argue is the best example of what this actually looks like. It's in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and I'll give you a quick backstory so you know what's going on here. Jesus had accepted a dinner invitation at the house of a Pharisee. As a reclined at the table, a woman with a past a very sinful past, heard that Jesus was there. So she comes with her alabaster jar of perfume, and you need to understand that this was before the days of embalming, and they would save up all of their lives what some believe would be the equivalent of one year's salary and in income and pay. And they would have this oil for their burial. And as was the custom in the day, they would keep it in this alabaster jar and this was the oil that would be put on them upon their death. Interesting, uh, just as a side note, parenthetically, uh, this woman is about to anoint Jesus for his death on the cross. It gets better. She comes there. She's got this alabaster jar of perfume. She then proceeds to stand behind him, we're told, at his feet, and she is weeping. 
seemingly uncontrollably. So much so, and she's shedding so many tears that she actually wets the feet of Jesus with her tears. Then we're told she, with her hair, picture this in your mind's eye. With her hair, she wipes, even washes the feet of Jesus with her hair and her tears. And then she kisses his feet. By the way, another uh, thing parenthetically to insert here, that's what the word worship means in, its orig in the original language. It carries with it the idea of bowing down and worshiping and kissing the feet of the one you're worshiping. And that's what she's doing. And then she pours this extremely expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus. Whoa! Whoa, I never! The Pharisee sees this. <laughs> and, and it's interesting. We're told that he said to himself, in other words, he didn't say it out loud. He's thinking this in his own mind. He's thinking to himself of Jesus, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. <laughs> this is where it gets really interesting. And astonishing even. Jesus reads his mind. He didn't say it out loud. He thinks it to himself. And Jesus reads his mind. He's hearing every thought. That should give us pause. Should it not? Oh my goodness. Reading his mind, he teaches a parable about two debtors. One of which owed his lender something like, we'll just say for purpose of discussion, $10. That's all. Ten bucks. And the other who owed his debtor, let's say, $10 million. That's the disparity in this parable that Jesus is now going to teach. After the parable, then, he asks this question of the Pharisee. Which one will love more when their debts are forgiven? To which Simon answers, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. <laughs> Duh. Jesus tells him that he answered correctly then. He turns toward the woman and says to Simon, not to her, to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet as was the custom to do when you had a guest in your house. They had walked there with their sandals. Their feet are filthy. And to honor the guests that you had invited into your home, you're going to offer them water to wash their feet. You didn't do that. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. He did not give me a kiss, as again was the custom in that day and even today in the Middle East in my Arab culture. When you greet somebody, you kiss them on the one side of the cheek and then the other side of the cheek. Sometimes, this was weird growing up, you know, as a kid, I'm watching my Arab family and, you know, these men are embracing each other and greeting each other and they're kissing. I'm like, enough already. This is weird. You're freaking me out. We don't do this in America. <laughs> But that's how they would greet. It was a, a, a show of respect and, and honor. And this was the customary greeting. You know when the Apostle Paul says, greet one another with a holy kiss? That's what he's referring to. In that culture, in that day, that's how you would greet somebody. And they didn't do that. Isn't that interesting? 
But this woman, you, you would not give me or greet me with a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. He did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Not my head, my feet. The filthiest part of the body. This is another cultural dynamic that we really don't understand here in, in the United States, but in the Middle East, you never put your feet up when you have guests. And you know the reason? Because you're showing to your guests the filthiest part of your body, not just your feet, but the bottom of your feet, and it is a sign of disrespect. You remember many years ago when then President George W. Bush was in Iraq, and this, uh, one of these reporters <laughs> takes his shoe off and throws it at, at the president and he ducks and, and it misses him. That is the ultimate sign and show of disrespect. You're taking this filthy shoe off of your filthy foot and you're throwing it at him. Anyway, I just thought I'd uh, mention that. I feel better now having shared that. And listen to what he says. Therefore, I tell you. He's going he's to kind of fill in the blanks now for them, <laughs> particularly for Simon. He's going to explain to him why it is that she did and he did not. Her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And then he says this, but whoever has been forgiven little... Not that he's pointing at him, but he didn't need to. Whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. That's the source of her love. You think she could come in and manufacture a love of that grand and glorious nature? No way. No way. How am I going to love God in that way? Here's the way. How am I going to love you? And by the way, I, I do love you. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? I love you. <laughs> I love you with a love that only God. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven. It's impossible for us this side of heaven in the finite <laughs> adequately express to you how thankful we are for your infinite agape love for us. Lord, I pray that we would be numbered amongst those of whom it can be said, my, they love much. It must be that they've been with Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.